Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you once again during this crazy time. Um, Some states are opening up. If you are in one of those states, please continue to be careful. If you are not in one of those states, please continue to, you know, do your best to stay home and stay sane and all of those wonderful things. I do have an author interview for you today. I am speaking with author Mark Graham about two books, actually one fiction and one nonfiction. So that's always fun when you get to talk about uh, different genres with the same author. The first book that we talk about is called Runes for Writers. Uh, the subtitle is Boost Your Creativity and Destroy Writer's Block. Did I mention the author's name is Mark Graham? See, I'm telling you, my brain just does not work properly. Uh, The author is Mark Graham. (laughs) The book is Runes for Writers, uh, Boost Your Creativity and Destroy Writer's Block. The back says, Tired of Struggling with Writer's Block? This ancient system helps storytellers across the realm of ideas, the world of muses. By integrating left and right brain activity, you can open your awareness to the subconscious levels where true creativity takes place. Rune for, runes for writers can take you from blocked to unblocked for good. The runes of the Elder Futhark were used by ancient Norse shamans for divination centuries before they came into use as a writing system. Now, novelist and shaman, shaman, mm, shamanic shamanic wow why can't i say that word um you know the word shaman shamanic practitioner (laughs) mark graham brings these tools of the ancients into the 21st century using a combination of cards tiles and dice writers and storytellers in any medium can silence the inner editor and tap directly into the source of story with a series of rune castings created specifically for storytelling you can develop character sketches troubleshoot scenes, design major plot points, even outline your entire story. A companion to the Runes for Writers story development system, this book is your guide into the fascinating world of deep, intuitive storytelling. So how fascinating is that? Um, I read the back of that book when it was sent to me and I thought, wow, I, I... I have to find out more about this. And so I had a really interesting conversation with Mark about his technique for destroying writer's block. And let's go ahead and turn to that conversation so he can explain it far better than I could in terms of using this system of runes and his process to destroy writer's block. So this interview is with Mark Graham. The first book we are talking about is Runes for Writers. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I appreciate your having me. I am excited to have you here, and we are actually here to talk about two of your books. One is fiction and one is nonfiction. Before we get to the books, though, if you could share a bit about yourself um, so my listeners can get to know you a little bit, that would be great. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm Mark Graham. I am, a uh, by day, a mechanical engineer. Um, in the construction industry and by nights and weekends, uh, a writer. Um, I, I have a, a deep passion for, for storytelling and for history. I think both of these media have uh, things to, to teach us and to learn, um, things that we can learn from. And, um, you know, I, I think story has great power to, to change lives, whether that be through 
novels, through short stories, through speeches, you know, uh, TED speeches or, or cinema. Um, you know, story is, is perhaps the most powerful method for change for, for the human species. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just, it's something I'm just really passionate about and, uh, and have a great love for in, in all its genres. Yeah, I think that definitely shows through, especially in, I want to, I want to start first with your nonfiction work. Um, it's called Ruins for Writers because you were just talking about the story. And, um, the subtitle of the book is Boost Your Crea Creativity and Destroy Writer's Block. So I'm really intrigued by this and, um, very excited to hear what you have to say about it. So can you give an overview sure. of the book? Sure. So the uh, it's pretty much as the title suggests. It, it's really a means of applying the ancient Norse runes, which were um, at, at their base element, they were the the writing system uh, of the of the ancient Norse and Germanic peoples, uh, similar to our alphabet. Um, but at a more fundamental level, and I think this is true with all alphabets. Um, they they were symbolic and they were shamanic tools. Uh, tools of divination in and of themselves. And so I have um, adapted them uh, through, through meditation, through practice. I, I have adapted uh, these tools of divination to uh, specifically help storytellers connect to their inner creativity, to that that inner voice, the muse, the guides, whatever, however, um, you know, whatever term writers are comfortable with for their own practice. Uh, these tools can uh, help them to not only connect to that source of, of creativity, but really open those channels um, so that any time, you know, they don't have to wait for the muse to come to them anymore. They can call the muse to them. Um, and, and that's really what I've discovered in my own work um, when it's not simply resistance that's keeping me from, from the page. Um, when writer's block shows itself, it's because, uh, you know, there's that blockage between my consciousness, my intellect, and that creativity. And so I've discovered that by using, uh, these runes in particular, but uh, there's, there's a broad range of shamanic and divinatory tools that can be used for the same purpose. Um, but specifically in this instance, in using the runes to connect and open those channels to creativity, those blocks, um, simply dissolve there, there there's no room for them because that flow uh, becomes so strong yeah fascinating um I, and it's it's uh, it's not a terribly long book it's only a little over 100 pages um and it's not how do i say this it's it's not as as dense as you might expect of a book like this you know you kind of expect <laughs> it to be a little dry a little you know um textbook like but you you're very conversational about it and there's one chapter I like it's called how all this stuff works I mean, so it, it's pretty it's more casual than than textbook I would say sure. what yeah, um absolutely what got you interested in runes in the first place so I've always been a, a curious person and you can use that in both meanings of the word um so for for many years i've i've investigated um different esoteric practices i grew up rather uh fundamentalist christian and so my early explorations were in more of the western mystery traditions um and as that exploration deepened and evolved uh, i got more into european indigenous practices druidry and ultimately into uh, the Norse shamanic practices. And so I had known of the runes and, and looked into the runes for oh, at least 10, 15 years. Uh, but then a couple of years ago, I really uh, deepened that practice um, and, and began working with the teacher um, in, in the runes. And it was actually, as I was, there are there are 24 runes in the the Elder Futhark, which is the the earliest uh, coherent writing system that we have uh, among the uh, the Norse or the Germanic writing systems. Um, and so, as part of my practice and my studies, uh, I would take uh, one rune and use that as my focus of meditation for a week. So this was about a 
a half half year long practice, uh, 24 weeks. And in about the middle of that practice, um, this this notion of using the runes as a creativity tool pretty much sprang forth, almost fully formed. Um, you know, kind of mixing my uh, mythologies, but like Athena springing from Zeus's forehead, the idea just kind of appeared and, and there wasn't much I had to do. Um, I, I don't like to say I invented the system more I developed it because it, it, it pretty much invented and revealed itself uh, all on its own. See, I told you, fascinating, right? We are going to take our first break of the podcast. And when we come back, Mark will talk a little bit more about uh, the additional research that he did for writing this book in addition to his own practice of working with the runes. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing, and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Mark Graham. We are currently speaking about his nonfiction book, Runes for Writers. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. And so in terms of writing the book from your own practice, um, did you do a lot of extra research then for the book or did you just write about the techniques that you were taught and, and go from there? Uh, I did a fair bit of research. Um, you know, the the runes are fairly. It's I have to say it's a reconstructed science. Um, you know, we we lost our connection to the runes for a good thousand years after um, I think Iceland was the final uh, Scandinavian country to convert to Christianity, and the runes went deep, deep underground for uh, at least seven hundred years. At that point, um, in the uh late 18th century perhaps 19th century uh there began a kind of revival as um dilettantes and and scholars with little else to do began applying largely say 
uh, the, the tenets of, of Freemasonry or Rosicrucianism or some of the other Western mystery traditions uh, began applying those to the runes. And it's really kind of an apples and oranges kind of thing. Uh, so it, there are many, many, I, that's a long way of saying, there are a lot of different interpretations of what each of the runes means, how to interpret them. So uh, it, it did. I, I, there was quite a bit of research into uh, what I had been taught directly, but then also what what do other scholars have to say about this? What what are other researchers saying? And um, and then it was really putting them to practice. And as I, <clears throat> if there are two different meanings to the rune, you know, meditate on it, study it, apply it to a story, and which which meaning or a completely different separate meaning um, really reveals itself and, and kind of proves itself. So it was. Uh, research. It was also kind of an experimental approach as well. And what has been the response to people who have uh, used the technique? Yeah, you know, it's been really interesting. Uh, I first start. I have a, a fantastic uh, critique group here in uh, in the Denver area, and uh, so once I kind of pulled this together and had a, a rough feel for what this looked like, I pulled in all my favors and, and uh, gathered a few guinea pigs. And um, almost universally, it's, you know, if this if this were Salem in the 1600s, I would be in danger probably. <laughs> um, in, in all cases, as it, whether I've done it for people I know, uh, and I kind of know what they're writing, or for strangers as I've done workshops for other writers groups, um, you know, the results of, uh, as far as I've been able to tell, the results from all the readings have a direct application to the story. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's been really interesting. And and people, you know, this is a fairly uh, esoteric, one might say a woo-woo kind of approach to storytelling. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm always a little hesitant of, of how it's going to be received, but pretty much across the board, if someone understands there are runes involved, and there are rune castings. You know, they they kind of have to come to the table with an open mind, and with that that sole caveat, um, you know, it, it's been very well received, and um, and the interpretations and, and the methodology has uh, has has proven very effective. And uh, you, you mentioned specifically at the beginning of the book that this is for um, experienced storytellers. So this isn't really a, this isn't a how-to book. Um, this isn't a, hey, I want to write. How do I start? This is more, I have been writing. Maybe I need a little push in the right direction to get my story going where it should. Yeah. Is that accurate? Know, I mean, writing is, I, I, I'd say that's accurate. Um, and I'm, I'm, Toying with developing a, a follow-on book that that gets a little bit more into the the fundamentals of writing and storytelling itself, but for this first excursion um, and my first nonfiction book, uh, it, it's really intended, as, as you said, to kind of give that push. You know, I I, I want the the writer to bring you know fundamental craft, um, you know, fundamental notions of structure of of story form of characterization uh the idea is really to you know it, as you it, it's kind of plugging in the the gaps of of a reasonably well-formed story to begin with um you know so it's not going to teach you syntax it's not going to teach you structure that we do touch on the hero's journey as a as a uh, one particular um uh, framework for story structure, um, but it really is intended for for people who who have told stories before. Ideally, um, as I mentioned in the book, it, you know, someone has finished, has a completed manuscript, um, and has gone through the the blood, sweat, and tears of crafting a fully formed story. And you know, so those chops are already developed. But you're really looking for something to take you to the next level to to boost your creativity, as I say, and to really improve your productivity. Um, you know, I, and a lot of this comes from my own experience. My first novel took me about eight years from story conception to a publishable piece of work. And uh, I have 
dozens more stories to tell. Uh, just recently had my 50th birthday. So that, that framework is not going to work for me if I want to tell all of these stories uh, within this lifetime. So, uh, and, and that's really what this is for. It's to help writers who, who know how to write really to uh, streamline that process to not have to wait for the muse, as I said earlier, but to, to, to call her forth to get those words on the page, to get the story flowing, and uh, you know, to uh, I'd say to boost their productivity as well as their creativity. I have a somewhat random aside about this, but um, mm -hmm. as I was going through the book, I kept thinking about. Um, have you ever read Rick Riordan's Magnus Chase series? <laughs> no. Okay, well, it's about the Norse gods, and the, many of these runes are in there, and I was like, hey, I recognize that. Hey, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, an, there's an elf who uses the runes, so that's just my oh, random nice. aside on runes. <laughs> that's great. Uh, who's that author? They were, I'll that up. Uh, Rick Riordan, he wrote the Percy Jackson series. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. A newer one about, uh, it's called Magnus Chase and the Gods of Ad Asgard. Oh, fun. I will look yeah. that up. Um, so yeah, lots of runes in there um, made me think of that. Yep, I might not know really anything about runes in, in a historical context, but I can usually come up with some fiction that I've read that contains something relating to whatever we're talking about. It's a weird skill. But at any rate, we're going to go ahead and take our second break of the podcast. And when we come back, we'll be switching our attention from Mark's nonfiction work to his uh, novel, which is called Daughter of the, excuse me, Son of the Sea, Daughter of the Sun. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with Mark Graham today, and before the break, we were talking about his nonfiction book, Runes for Writers. As I said, we're now going to turn our attention to his historical fiction novel. It is called Son of the Sea, Daughter of the Sun. Um, a shipwrecked prince on a foreign shore and a young princess coming into her powers battle dark forces that would destroy her kingdom and their love. 900 years before Columbus, a sailor with a mystical map and a vision of a glorious destiny is shipwrecked on the far side of the world. A prince of Visigothic Spain, Eudela, finds his match in Shaken, daughter of a Mayan king. Can love span the gulf between them, or will they be cast apart by their different gods, or by the dark shaman who desires Shaken for himself? That is the description of the book and even though in the interview i specifically ask mark to pronounce the main characters names i just stumbled over them so i do apologize for that that's the description of son of the sea daughter of the sun also by mark graham so let's go ahead and turn back to that interview move on to your um to your novel and this is <laughs> historical fiction it's called son of the sea daughter of the sun and can you give an overview of this story? Uh, sure. So it's in uh, short form. It's essentially a uh, Visigothic prince meets Maya princess uh, about a thousand years before Columbus, and uh, and mayhem ensues. So ideally, this will be uh, the first in a uh, multi-part series that will culminate in a uh, total round-the-world voyage uh, about 900 years before Columbus. Okay, that may be the one of the best elevator pitches I've ever heard. Visigoth <laughs> prince, Mayan princess. <laughs> um, even just that, you're like, wait, what? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, what was your inspiration for the story? So many years ago, I'd stumbled across uh, what's known as the Piri race map. Uh, this is a map that was uh, discovered in Turkey in the uh, the, the old uh, palace in Istanbul. Um, I think in 1927, this map was discovered and it was dated back to the early 1500s, I think 1518 or somewhere around there. Um, the map shows very accurately the, the western coast of Europe and Africa and the eastern coast of the Americas. Uh, so this is, again, early uh, 1500s. So, you know, we're maybe 20, 25 years after Columbus. Uh, and arguably, uh, based on later cartographic research and uh, research with different types of geometric projections, of, you know, turning a spherical surface into a flat map uh, and all those, those fun mathematical things that we learned once upon a time and have never touched again, um, through, through later research that was conducted in the mid-1900s, uh, it was found to be more accurate in its depiction of the coastlines and in particular of longitude, which is the east-west direction, than any maps that came for another two to three hundred years after this map. Um, it's a little more uh, conjectural, but reasonably sound that it actually shows uh, some of the west coast, the south and west coast of Panama, and may actually represent fairly accurately some of the Antarctic coastline, which was not discovered for another 200 years. So in, in reading all these facts about this map um, and some of the speculation, it really got those creative juices flowing, those wheels turning of how did this map in, in Turkey, landlocked more or less because they could not get through uh, the gates of Gibraltar, they could not get through the Med, how did this map get come to be? Um, and so Imperi Reis was a, an admiral in the Turkish Navy and mentioned how he had kind of compiled this from um, earlier maps that he had found dating all the way back to Ptolemy for so for some 2,000 years before he put his map together. And as storytellers are want to do, we, we, we want to know the why and the how. Um, and so that became the basis for this story. And initially, I was going to set it in Constantinople, in Istanbul. Uh, but as I began more research and 
kind of figuring out the logistics. I kept moving farther back in time and farther toward the Atlantic Ocean, farther to the west, until I finally landed in Spain in the uh, in the seventh century. And and then all the the puzzle pieces kind of dropped into place for uh, for what became this story. Thank you for that. Now the um, the one of the main characters, and I'm going to have you pronounce both of their names: <laughs> the the, the visiting <laughs> prince and the Mayan princess, please. Yes, uh, we have Yudala, uh, uh, who is the, the Visigothic prince, and Chakin, a uh, daughter of okay. the uh, king of the city state of Shukti. And um, what about each of them do you think will resonate with readers? Um, you know, their story, if, if it were a slightly different telling, this could probably be a young adult story. Um, being set when it is, uh, you know, there, there were no young adults. You had children and then they became adults. Um, and, and so it's while the characters are, um, you know, they range – throughout the course of the book from uh, I think about six years to 18 years old of age through, over the course of the book, um, you know, they, they face very adult uh, situations, very adult circumstances, as was the norm in that, that time period and in that culture. But, you know, there, there is a certain coming of age element um, for, for each of the characters. Um, and there's, and beyond that, there's that, that juxtaposition, that thing that I think we all struggle with, even in, well into adulthood, of, you know, this is what my society and my culture tells me I should be. This is what my heart is calling me to be. And it's it's that fight, that struggle that each of them has, I think, that makes this a, a very human story um, and, and an accessible story, even across the, the gulf of time and cultures. Uh, that separate a modern reader from from these characters. Um, so I'm going to ask you the research question again. How much research did you do for this book? Obviously, it, you, you know, there was the map that inspired it, but then how much did you have to do for the time period and the different locations? Yeah, this one, um, a lot <laughs> is the short answer. Um, you know, my, my wife... Um, frequently points out my propensity to to buy books when I could just go to the library or or uh, get them on Kindle or what, or what have you but um, many many shelves were filled with uh, with books for for the research um, interestingly enough the uh, the Mayan period was easier to research than the Visigothic period um, you know even though we've only known about the Maya for uh, I mean, we've known of them for the last 500 plus years, but pretty much everything had been wiped out. We haven't, you know, we only just deciphered their alphabet about 120 years ago. Um, and that those were the first characters. The the major work in that department was done in the 80s and 90s. So uh, that research is very fresh, but it's 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 told us more about their culture uh, than we know about. Europe about Spain in the uh, the beginning of the Dark Ages, um, so it was a, a lot of research for the the, uh, the European portion for the Visigothic period, uh, a lot of dry reading of chronicles of church conventions of, of things of that nature, and um, and trying to fill in the details of of character and time and place and, and feel, um, and then for the I think for the Mayan research period. It was really enlivened by the archaeology. As it turned out, I didn't notice as I was doing my research and, and choosing um, my my locales, but the Muse obviously had a plan for this. Um, but one of the best preserved sites happens to be Copan in Honduras, or as it uh, is called in, in, the, in the novel, uh, Shukpi. And uh, so we have the temple that was uh, – in existence at the time of the of the story period, perfectly preserved, intact inside the modern temple or the the later temple that that we see at ground level today. It's actually entombed within the extant temple on the surface. 
we have altars and statues and inscriptions. We have the largest collection of Maya glyphs um, in Mesoamerica at this site. Um, so the, the research was just fascinating. Um, uh, and I'm a history nerd to begin with, so I was doubly uh, enthralled in this. But I think even even the, uh, the layman or the casual scholar um, would be fascinated to know all of the, the workings of this particular city-state kind of on the fringes. You know, when we think of the Maya, we think of the Yucatan, we think of, of Mexico and uh, Costa Rica. So we're on the southern fringe of that culture. Um, and perhaps because of that distance, this site was just forgotten and, and preserved in nature and not overrun uh, by by later cultures. So uh, the research was just a lot of fun. And I probably took uh, six to nine months of research before I put a word on the page for this one. Wow, that's really fascinating. We are going to go ahead and take another break. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more about the time frame of the book, um, that, that time frame in terms of its setting in historical fiction. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with Mark Graham about his historical fiction novel, Daughter, Son of the Sea, Daughter of the Sun. And let's turn our attention back to that interview. Often when we think of historical fiction, you know, I mean, that can take place anywhere, but we don't often think of this far back. So why, <laughs> um, for you, what draws you to this time period? You know, it really had to do with the map, and and as an engineer, you know, I, I I try to pick things apart and understand how all the pieces and parts work together, and be able to put it back to, together again without too many spare parts left over. Um, and so it really began with, okay, we have this map that relies on knowledge of the Americas prior to really the, the, the Roman period. If, if the Romans had known about it, everyone would have known about it eventually. So it had to be either well before that period or after the fall of the empire. Um, it became easier to, to move forward in history. And um, so we're, we're sitting in the, the story opens around 610 uh, of the common era. Um, so we're 200 years after the first sack of Rome were in the early throes of the dark ages so that's a perfect time for a law you know for for a significant event in history to be lost um so so that really led me to to that particular story um or that time period and then narrowing it down um you know who was my character who was my protagonist and as i i began to get an idea of who utila was uh, I knew he would probably have to be a noble uh, to be able to to go on this trip to bring back some knowledge um, to to bring back enough knowledge that it could be recorded in uh, some sort of documentation that Piri race could later draw upon. And as I began my research, I discovered that there are this is the one of those fascinating things that seems to happen at some point in all of my stories that where where history just drops a, a golden nugget in my lap. Um, we have a pretty solid idea of the king lists of the Visigoths in Spain, even though it's not a, 
a popular period in history, it's fairly well documented. Um, you know, we know that within, for example, a two-year period, I think there are eight different kings. You know, so it was a very turbulent period, um, a lot of political and religious upheaval, but it's well documented. Well, there are two coins in existence, and each of the kings stamped their own coins, of course, but there are two, king, two coins uh, that have been uh, recovered from the years um, that are stamped Eutola Rex Cathorum, Eutola King of the Goths. And this name appears nowhere in the king list, nowhere in the church chronicles, nothing. And based on the, the style and the imagery, um, uh, the, the scholars have been able to locate it in history to about the around 630 or so, where we know this other king, was, it was the middle of his reign, but there are no records of this. So that, of course, um, raises the uh, even, even more questions for a writer to, to start gnawing on. So that once I discovered that, I knew that that was my protagonist. So that locked me into the period of history, which just happened to coincide with the golden age of, of Shukbi, of Copan and Andres. Uh, so the, those two facts just told me that I'd landed on the, the right time and space uh, for, for this story to take place. All right. Thank you. And then what draws you in particular to writing historical fiction? I mean, you mentioned you're a history nerd, so that's probably part of it. What about this genre draws you? Yeah, it's, you know, the, I think part of it is the maxim that those um, who do not remember the history are doomed to repeat it. Um, and so I really like to look into the historical framework and in, in some ways it's you know i have very definite ideas and and philosophies about how the world should work and and how uh you know the the the, the best ways the most utilitarian way to to lead your life individually as a society society and so forth and to write that in a a modern day story can become pedantic can become um you know, kind of preachy and, and, and just not necessarily well received, but to put that into allegory in the in a historical setting, a historical time frame, um, and then just to tell a story with with a lesson behind it, you know, obviously with a, a, a strong theme that resonates today, but let the reader draw their own opinion rather than overtly stating what I'm saying. Um, so I, I find historical fiction a great way to kind of tell those morality tales um, without going overboard. And it can be read strictly for entertainment. It can be read at that more subtle level for, um, you know, for the, the satire and for the uh, social commentary. But, um, you know, it, in addition, it's also fun to look back at a lot of the tropes you know, there's the uh, the, the well-worn axiom that the history is written by the victors and also the history is a lie agreed upon. So I like to look back through history, take the story that we think we know, and then reverse engineer that, kind of look backwards through the people. And if this is the story or the lie that's been agreed upon by the victors, what was the real story? And so for me to get those creative juices turning of taking events or stories that we think we know, kind of twist them, turn them on their heads and, and think, you know, what might the story have been that then political, religious intrigue, uh, personal motivation, whatever, then warped that story to, uh, to give us what, what we know. So sometimes I get uh, a bit of pushback that that's not how it happened. Well, that's how it happened in this version. <laughs> right. That's where the fiction part comes in, potentially. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that you would like to see this as a series. Are you working on the next installment, or do you have that in mind? Uh, I have it in mind. I have um, two, possibly three uh, follow-on stories that will kind of continue our voyage, explore some other fun things that are happening about this time in history. 
and uh, eventually we'll get you to live back home. Okay. And are there any of your, this is not your first novel, are there any of your other books that you would like to highlight at this point? Um, yeah, I have my uh, two uh, earlier novels. Uh, the first was uh, Of Ashes and Dust, which is a kind of bounced all around history. Uh, this is a uh, American Civil War era, uh, Civil War and Transcontinental Railroad uh, founding of the West era. Um, uh, so if, if uh, any of your listeners are into that time period, that'll be a fun one. And then uh, Song of Songs, a novel of the Queen of Sheba, which takes us even farther back in time, about 3,000 years, um, for a, uh, a, a retelling of uh, that popular story. All right. Thank you for that. In terms of your writing, um, I know you said that you are um, an engineer, but um, when did you start writing, and is it something that you've always kind of wanted to do or always done? Um, what was that like for you? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, as I think about it, I, I don't remember learning to read. So that's, you know, words and books and story have always been a part of my life. Um, and I was very young when I began, you know, you know picked up the the pencil and, and took my uh, first stab at writing some really atrocious science fiction. Um, to set that aside for a while uh in my college years i had the idea of writing some clancy type novels which will probably never see the light of day to protect uh, the reading public um but it was when i got the idea for of ashes and dust and that was uh oh gosh in the late 90s um that that was finally a story that just would not let me go uh it was a story that i had to finish and once that was done and the next idea came along and the next idea um the i was i was stuck i had to <laughs> i had to continue doing this so uh yeah it's been about uh, just over 20 years that i've been uh seriously pursuing this craft Time for one last break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about Mark's advice for aspiring authors. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. author Mark Graham. And then out of your own experience, um, what advice would you have for someone who thinks they would like to write? Uh, you know, the best advice I could give is follow your passion. Um, you know, this is a, a, a challenging industry. It's getting easier. Publication is easier now than it's ever been, but, um, public acceptance and and embrace embracing of your work is possibly even harder than it's, than it's ever been because there's so much um I don't, I don't like the word competition it's not a zero sum game but there's so much uh uh distraction there's so much out there that that getting your work found is 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 a challenge it will be a challenge and if you're going to weather that it's not to say success can't be had it most certainly can um, but, you know, there will be many challenges and there will be many frustrations and setbacks and, and heartache. And if you are writing to the market, if you're writing because you think a particular genre or setting or, or what have you will, uh, you know, capture the public imagination at a particular time, you won't have the, the drive and the impetus and the strength to, to keep going through those challenging times. 
But if you're writing what you're passionate about, if you're writing the story that has called you to tell it, then that in itself will give a young writer the uh, the strength and the encouragement, uh, the stick to to get through those challenging times, uh, to stick to it. Uh, writing in itself is a challenge, let alone all the the, the fun things out there in the industry. Um, but if, if you're following that passion, then that will give you the strength and the, the stamina to, to keep going and to pursue this dream. Thank you. And when you take time to read for yourself, who are your favorite authors or what are your favorite genres? Yeah, um, as it's probably evident by uh, my choice of genre to write in, uh, historical fiction is um, is my passion both to write and to read. Uh, Bernard Cornwell, hands down, is uh, is my favorite author in the genre. Uh, Wilbur Smith is a, another fantastic writer. Uh, I have a great number of friends um, that uh, are also inspiring. Uh, Cameron Pasha, uh, C.W. Gortner, uh, Kate Forsyth uh, are also fantastic writers uh, who are writing today in the historical genre. And um, th these are guys that, that give me uh, a lot of inspiration, a lot of encouragement. All right. I know you have a website, so um, tell people where they can find the website as well as where they might be able to interact with you on social media. Sure. Um, so my website is mark, uh, M-A-R-C dash gram, G-R-A-H-A-M dot com. Uh, just Mark Graham, one word, is a, a punk rocker in the UK, so that is not me. Uh, so it's mark-gram.com. Uh, uh, you can get me on Facebook at Mark Graham Books. And um, for the runes, the easiest way and easiest to remember is just runesforwriters.com. All right. Thank you. We've talked about quite a few different things, but is there uh, is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to bring up now in terms of writing or your books or anything that we haven't touched on? Uh, yeah, we've covered uh, a lot of it. I, I appreciate your uh, allowing me to go on this journey with, with everyone. Um, I, I would say for for storytellers, um, either current uh, working storytellers or uh, hopefuls, you know, story is is power. Um, you know, we are the shamans of today. We are the myth makers of today. And you know, for the past thousand, two thousand years, we've we've really gotten away from our myths. And myths are critical to not just our, our psychic well being, but to our evolution as a species. And as storytellers, you know, we we have some responsibility for uh, the caretaking of of that fundamental core of, of who we are as human beings. So I, I want to encourage uh, all storytellers, you know, if if you get discouraged, if you um, are, are feeling the strain, feel it's not worth it, just remember that, uh, you know, if the story has called you, that that is a high calling and a great honor. And, and, and that's a gift that the world needs from you that only you can give. Uh, so I just want to encourage all those writers out there uh, who have um, faced challenges, who have faced discouragement uh, and rejection, just to know that that's a moment in time and that that does not define you and that your story needs you and we need your story. And uh, just to, to take that pen back up, get back to the keyboard and uh, stick with it. All right. Thank you for that. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, not only about runes for writers, but also son of the sea, daughter of the sun. I really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you once again to Mark for taking the time to speak with me about both of his books, uh, Runes for Writing, How to de uh, excuse me, Boost Your Creativity and Destroy Writer's Block. Um, if you are a, a writer or a storyteller of any kind and you struggle with writer's block, he may want to try this and just see if you uh, uh, can make the system work for you as well as it seems to work for Mark. The We also spoke about his 
novel, a historical fiction novel, Son of the Sea, Daughter of the Sun. So I appreciate Mark joining me to talk about both of those books as well as some of his other previous works. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners. I so greatly appreciate you. We could not do this podcast, of course, without you, so thank you. If you are a fan of this podcast and you have not already done so, it would be wonderful if you could give us a nice review, whether that be five stars or a nice written review. Either one is extraordinarily helpful. Please do also follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, GSMC Book Review. We would love to... Uh, we, I, I, we, but mostly I, would love to interact with you, to hear your thoughts on interviews, to hear what you're reading, what, you know, I just would love to hear from you in whatever you're doing in your reading life. Thank you again for joining me. Hope your day is going great, and I hope, as always, that that day involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you so much. And oh, you know what? I forgot to tease next episode on Tuesday. I will be speaking with author Craig DeLouis about his book, Our War. Um, so join me on Tuesday and have a great weekend. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.